Rynku I have very special guest, Professor Rudnicka, who organized this wonderful uh, hair meeting. Uh, Professor Rudnicka, you talked about alopecia areata, uh, so I would like to ask what is your approach to this condition and is your favorite treatment? Thank you very much for having me. It's a complex question because, of course, everything depends on the patient and we always make the decision individual. Let's start with the adults because maybe it's uh, a little bit easier. If it's a patient with mild um, alopecia areata, then probably we would start with injections of tramsinolone. It's now a rule that we should not inject patients who have salt more than 20, mainly because of the discomfort for the patient. So if it's more than salt 20, then usually we do not start with injections, we start with other treatments. There's now a discrepancy because our recommendation is to start systemic treatment with salt more than 20, meaning when more than 20% of the scalp is with no hair. But the treatment which is approved, it is approved starting for, from salt 50. So we have a major problem with patients who have salt between 20 and 50. Of course, we don't want to wait until someone develops salt 50. Usually, we would start with some traditional treatment and here I would go according to the order which was suggested uh, in the consensus. In the European consensus, we would start with cyclosporin. Maybe methotrexate would be an option, but there are more and more data showing that the efficacy is um, not so good. And there are now new data on long-term efficacy of azathioprine, which are very promising. So who knows, maybe azathioprine will move up, uh, maybe even above uh, cyclosporine. So we will see. Uh, the other option is in some countries, depending on the insurance, maybe the insurance will cover JAK inhibitor even if it's not salt fit. So this is a problematic uh, group of patients. And now the slightly easier group of patients is the group of patients with salt above 50 because we have now two or maybe three approved uh, medications for patients with salt more than 50. Uh, for salt more than 50, it would be recitinib and fritlacitinib in Europe. In America, there's additionally deuroxolitinib, which is registered. Today, it is not available yet on the market, but as I know, soon it will be available as well. Baricitinib is approved for patients who are adult and ritlacitinib is approved for patients who are 12 years or older. What about patients who do not react for uh, JAK inhibitors? Do you combine sometimes JAK inhibitors with other drugs? We just had this discussion uh, among experts and there are different opinions on this, but most of us would add on a glu glucocorticosteroid for a short time and then see whether we can improve the efficacy of the JAK inhibitor. But also, when we talk about JAK inhibitors, we have to keep in mind that these are medications which need a very long time to start working. Some of our patients have an improvement already after two or three months. Others are late responders, and then there are also very late responders. So meaning that some of the patients are taking the drug for one year before they see any improvement. Sometimes a good sign is that the patients start having eyebrows, eyelashes, the men start having a beard. This is a good indicator that maybe the regrowth of scalp hair will start in a moment. But also for this, sometimes we need to wait for a long time. We know that drug inhibitors are very effective, but we were maybe I don't think so, we are so much now, but we were worried about side effects. Mm -hmm. So we know data from the literature. How is in real life? Do you see serious side effects in patients with JAK inhibitors? This is a very important question. No, we do, we do not see side effects. Our patients are tolerating the, the treatment very well, but also there are two elements which need to be taken into consideration, that this is all about statistics. And I will focus on malignancies which may be associated or have been indicated to be associated with, um, with immunosuppressive treatment. And there are, during this conference, we have, shown, we have seen data which show that uh, the risk of uh, malignancy with JAK inhibitors 
is lower compared to cyclosporin and methotrexate. Mm. So uh, it's, it's all in the similar range. It's extremely rare. So first, it's not so common. And second, we are lucky to have a selection of patients who did not develop any adverse events or any serious adverse events. And also, we need to take into consideration that the JAK inhibitors need to be used for a very long time. And the question which we're asking sometimes, and uh, we hope that, the, that, uh, that we will not face any new problems with the JAK inhibitors over long time treatment, but maybe after 10 years of treatment or 20 years of treatment, maybe some adverse events will develop, which we do not know yet. And why I'm talking about such a long time? Because some of the patients, we can take off the treatment and they do not have, they have a uh, regrowth, they, we take them off the treatment and they do not develop a relapse, but many of the patients will develop a relapse once we want to taper down the dose. So these will be patients who will need a long time treatment, just the same as in other autoimmune diseases, like in psoriasis, like in diabetes and many mm -hmm. other autoimmune diseases. Yeah, I want about children because alopecia areata commonly affects pediatric population. Right now, with ritrecitinib is approved from 12 years of age. Uh, what do you think that it will be approved for a younger patient? Uh, what I think <laughs> may be very optimistic. <laughs> However, um, in young children, we would usually start with topical steroids. Mm. This is uh, the general rule that we use if we use the steroids. We rather go for the topical steroids, the smaller the extent or the severity of the disease and the smaller the child, we will go for the topical treatment. And then we go to systemic treatment, the more advanced the disease, but also the older yes, the child. Yeah. And um, in small children, we really do have a problem. If we uh, use systemic treatments, it's always off-label. The only on-label treatment now, currently, for children is ritalcitinib from the age of 12. And we know that there are now clinical trials going on with ch for children between the age of 6 and 12. We know that baricitinib is approved for another indication for atopic dermatitis from the age of 2. So we are very optimistic. But for now, it's off-label. And when that whatever is off-label is in many cases not covered by the insurance. But hopefully we will have new treatment for these uh, children because they sometimes really, the disease in some cases in pediatric population is also very severe and disease burden uh, is important, so, so hopefully. But I think there's one important thing about children because especially in children, we need to be sure about the diagnosis because there are many diseases, yeah. especially in children, which may cause total alopecia including some genetic diseases, including different syndromes. And if we misdiagnose or overdiagnose alopecia areata, then we may uh, run into the problem that we are using treatment which is good for alopecia areata, but, but if we did not make sure that we have the correct diagnosis, will not work. Yes, so here is, I think, a good place to mention trihoscopy, because trihoscopy is a very useful method which help us to diagnose this patient. And even last week I had patient which clinically, I, I thought about alopecia areata, but then I made some trihoscopy and I saw that it's trihotilomenia. So I think it's very important to perform uh, this trichoscopy in all patients with hair loss, not only children, but also in adults. Yes, especially if there are patches, uh, especially patches in children. We need to think about trichotillomania. We also should think about tinea capitis. These are the most common differential diagnosis. But in a patient who has total alopecia, this may be some other causes yeah. of the disease. Maybe it needs to be underlined that now, currently, according to every recommendation and every consensus, the diagnosis of alopecia areata should be made on the basis of clinical evaluation and on the basis of trichoscopy. And if we are not sure, then we perform yeah. a biopsy for histology. But uh, the time from many years ago, when we were making the diagnosis only on the basis of clinical evaluation, mm -hmm. these, this, is, this became history. Also because back then we did not have such effective and um, specific treatments. 
And when I talk about effective treatments, I think there's, it needs to be underlined. There's no treatment in the world which is effective 100%. So it's never like this that 100% of our patients will have an effective treatment with either of the older or newer drugs. There will be patients who respond to therapy, there will be patients who partly respond to therapy, and there will be patients who do not respond to therapy at all. And for these patients, we will be looking for another option of therapy. Yeah, about another option, do you use minoxidil in patients with alopecia areata? Do you like it? Um, it has been shown that it may be of some benefit in patients with alopecia areata. My feeling is that it mainly helps to make the hair thicker once the hair is there. Maybe it increases a little bit the speed of growing of hair which is already there, but I don't think it makes a major difference. So I try to avoid polypragmasy. For this reason, maybe this will be not my first choice. If I have a patient who responds to therapy and we want to do a little bit more, mm -hmm. then maybe we would add on minoxidil. What is your favorite drug for hair loss? <laughs> it's a difficult <laughs> question. For alopecia areata. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, okay, we can start from alopecia areata. I think for now it's JAK inhibitors for two reasons because it's new, we are yeah. always fascinated by the new, and also because it's easy, you know? It's easy monitoring, easy taking. It's like one pill per day. Uh, monitoring is really very simplified. Yeah. So um, it's easier, for example, compared to cyclosporine, because with cyclosporine, we need more strict uh, monitoring more often. Usually with JAK inhibitors, we perform lab tests every three months, approximately and with uh, cyclosporine we perform t tests every few weeks. We need to check the blood pressure, pressure uh, of the patient because of the potential risk of increasing the blood pressure. So just to underline, cyclosporine is a safe way of treatment. It needs to be monitored. And when yeah. we see something changing slightly, then we decrease the dose and we are on the safe side. Now we love JAK inhibitors for alopecia areata, but do you think that in the future maybe some new, better drug will come? Of course, and I count on this. And I think we saw this with the psoriasis and with the biological drugs. But we started with some uh, drugs which are not used anymore. These were biological drugs, but we are not using them anymore because their efficacy mm -hmm. is much... Um, uh, lower compared to what we have now, and also the way of treatment, like uh, once per week, and the, the new ones are uh, less uh, common. So I think this will be the development for alopecia areata. We are now starting with a new uh, area of treatment of alopecia areata, and I am sure soon we will have treatment options will be, which will be more effective, easier, and requiring less monitoring. Yeah, but still, drug inhibitors are the first drugs approved for this disease. So, uh, so it's also interesting, and I think that it's a very big step in not only in alopecia areata, but also in all uh, trichology. Uh, and it's very important that we need drugs which are approved for, for our uh, condition. Yeah, let's, let's uh, really explain what means approved. Approved means that they were really checked in detail yeah. for efficacy and for safety in a large number of patients over a long time. And this had to be approved by an official agency. In Europe, it's the EMEA. In America, it's FDA. So this, is, this makes us confident that we are on the safe side when yeah. treating the patient, not only basis, based on the medical literature, but also on the basis of uh, formal registration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, regarding the first treatment uh, options which is approved, in some countries, some glucocorticosteroids have an indications for alopecia areata. But, oh. yeah, the, but uh, this is, of course, um, not of significance because we try to go away from glucocorticosteroids because of their adverse events. We still use them in alopecia areata because they work fast, and especially if someone is losing the hair in a high speed, then we use glucocorticosteroids to fast halt the speed of the of hair losing. But then we need something for long-term treatment because especially the JAK inhibitors, they need a long time to start showing efficacy as mentioned just a moment ago.
I think that the topic is, is very interesting and maybe we will continue later. But right now I would like to thank you very much for this thank you interview. Very much. So have a nice conference. And once again, I would like to say thank you. Thank you very much for also for your contribution in the whole trichology. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. And we are recording for you from the conference of the European Heritage Society in Warsaw, Poland, 2025.